All right, well, good morning. Um, I'm here today to talk to you guys a little bit more about palliative care as it pertains to neurologic conditions. Again, um, I'm Dr. Joel Phillips. Um, and my clinical practice is neuropalliative care, where um, I, I see a lot of patients in the outpatient setting, um, assisting them with palliative care needs from that neurologic perspective. So I wanted to give you guys an introduction to that today. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, I have no disclosures. Um, I wanted to give you a brief outline. Um, the objective really is to just broadly understand the role of neural palliative care. Um, it takes on a lot of different forms at this point. Um, we're starting to standardize things a little bit more, but um, just having that understanding is good today. Um, it's been about eight years since I've been doing this, um, or since I graduated neurology residency, I should say. And I, th I think even though eight years is a short time, it's enough to say that now we've got a bit of a historical context. So we're going to talk about some of that today um, and then look at what um, neuropalliative care looks like on the inpatient side as well as the outpatient side, look at some treatment strategies um, and look at advanced care planning, um, but also highlight um, the needs of caregivers um, as it pertains to these illnesses as well. Uh, so going back all the way to 1996, um, the AAN was starting to look into um, what is palliative care with neurology. Um, and, and they suggest that the provision of primary palliative care is the responsibility of all neurologists and, and kind of left things at, as that. Um, over the course of the next um, two decades, three AAN position statements came out, um, trying to define this a little bit more. Um, one looked at palliative care from that persistent and vegetative state, or not even palliative care, just addressing how do we, how do we treat these patients. Um, a second one came out a couple of years later about irreversibly, irreversibly paralyzed patients who retain cognition. And then finally, um, the most recent was um, patients lacking decisional capacity. Um, about 2017 or 2018, within the AAN, there was a palliative, pain and palliative care special interest, kind of like a special uh, section um, that split into two different sections. So palliative care was on its own. Um, in 2018, the AAHPM um, developed its own neuropalliative care special interest group. Um, so that's been going now for about five years itself. And then in 2020, um, the International Neuropalliative Care Society was born. Um, they are a society, society for both providers, but also for patients. And it's becoming a, a good advocacy um, group for patients as well and gives them a platform and a voice. Um, this week actually is the first um, international conference that's occurring in person. So unfortunately, I had to miss it this year, but um, that, that is a, a growing field. Um, just last year, um, the, the Neurology Journal came out with clinical guidance on neuropalliative care. So starting to um, develop a few more standards in care. So if you guys have a chance, um, that's a great article to read. Um, a lot of it talks about prognostic uncertainty and in different approaches um, with some ethics thrown in at the end. Um, there may be a lot of overlap with what you guys already understand as palliative care, but it's there to kind of explain to neurologists what it is we do. Um, the textbook definition of palliative or neuropalliative comes from Dr. Kreutzfeld and Dr. Holloway's book. Um, we define a neuropalliative care approach as a palliative care that focuses on specific needs of patients with neurologic illness and their families. Neuropalliative care thus represents both an emergency, emerging subspecialty within neurology and, pa and palliative care, as well as a holistic approach to people suffering from neurologic illnesses. So uh, that is a lot of what we are all doing, uh, regardless of the, the illness type, um, but just with more of a focus on neurology. Um, how I describe it to my patients, um, I've really got a script now when I'm for I'm introducing myself um, to patients for the first time. Um, I described to them that like Dr. X, I'm a neurologist, um, where they have their specialty training in movement disorders or neuromuscular disorders. My specialty training was in palliative care, which means I approach your condition from a different perspective. 
Uh, my role really is to come alongside you and your family um, by looking at how your con condition affects your day-to-day -day life. So then we talk about symptoms, developing that roadmap, um, and talking about treatments before things really truly become an issue. So giving patients that role in that context has really helped them understand what it is we, we are there to do for them. Uh, so the question comes down to who needs palliative care? Um, patients really kind of uh, fall into two different categories. There are patients patients with chronic progressive neurologic conditions, such as Parkinson's disease, ALS, uh, muscular dystrophies, MS, um, and even um, central, central tumors, spinal cord and brain tumors. Uh, but then there's also those with static injuries where you have an inciting event like a stroke or spinal cord. Um, but then there's lifelong sequelae after um, that that we're trying to to help deal with. Uh, you guys have seen um, diagrams like this before. Um, I wanted to highlight at least these first three here, and we'll come back to this this second one in a in a second. But um, we we actually uh, very similar to cancer. If you look at somebody with ALS, this is time and function, people start at diagnosis with that high function. And over time, we see that decline and then that precipitous fall off um, to death. Um, other diseases within the neuro neurologic realm, um, such as multiple sclerosis, follow more of that trajectory that we talk about with our patients with uh, COPD or CHF, where they've got an MS exacerbation. Um, as, as, they, as patients recover from that, function not, might not be where it was beforehand. Next event happens and we see this slow decline over time. Um, and again, frailty, um, dementia, um, starting at that low function and it's just a slow progressive decline over time with a few peaks and valleys. Um, but what I wanna show you guys um, as what Dr. Holloway, one of our neuropalliative doctors who's a stroke uh, neurologist as well, has really named something that kind of called this the fourth trajectory, where you have that stroke or that um, traumatic brain injury or something something significant happens and you go from living healthy and independent down to suddenly uh, in the ICU within hours of it happening. Um, from there, um, patients may may continue to decline to that point of death. But with stabilization and in time, there's that possibility of recovery. Um, and we might have patients recover some, get to more of a stable point where function is not, not where it was to begin with. Um, patients are definitely in a different spot, affected differently. Uh, often palliative care gets involved about here where we really do have that uncertainty of where that patient is going to be going. So keep this diagram in mind when you're talking to patients um, in the ICU um, post-stroke because it really is a fork in the road for a lot of these people. Uh, so when should palliative care get involved? Um, any, any time in the illness is, is a good time. Um, early on in something like Parkinson's, um, palliative care can be there to help um, with emotional support, um, kind of help people start to navigate and kind of wrap their heads around what is this that now I'm dealing with and what does that mean for the rest of my life? Um, more of the middle stages, we might be talking more about goals of care and starting to deal with some of the symptoms like the non-motor symptoms where the movement disorders doctor might be uh, still handling the cinemat, doing things like dystonias and, and dyskinesias as well as spasticity, but we can help with a lot of the other things like fatigue, con um, constipation, uh, sialuria, those sort of things. And then late um, transitions to hospice. Um, I'd say that um, experientially, I'm probably seeing a lot of people um, more in that middle stage. Um, just yesterday, I saw somebody in very late stages where first time I'm meeting them, we're starting to talk hospice. But um, within our ALS clinic, we're talking about getting in at an earlier diagnosis just to establish more of that care and rapport. And that's that's becoming more, more of our regular practice within that realm. Um, again, the mantra really is the earlier, the better. Um, there's an argument that patients and a lot of these patients will lose, lose their decision-making capacity. So the sooner we can introduce ourselves, provide support, develop that rapport, the sooner we can start talking about advanced directives, medical decision-making, and, and helping these patients along the way. 
So let's talk about inpatient palliative care for a while first. Um, so there are a, a, a few um, different contexts in which this occurs. Um, we can be called in when there's an acute neurologic injury, such as stroke, um, traumatic brain injury, um, which we've mentioned already, um, status epilepticus, and sometimes the inflammatory encephalopathies, um, something like a perineoplastic syndrome where um, the autoantibodies are causing an encephalitis um, and even sometimes seizures. Um, so those acute injuries, but we can also see patients hospitalized with progression of their, their chronic neurologic illness, such as ALS. Um, Parkinson's is another big one where patients um, are likely to be um, hospitalized for pneumonia. Um, so we may be catching these patients at um, sentinel events um, within their care. Um, we often get called in to talk about goals of care, talk about treatment options and, and what uh, tracheostomy, PEG, those sort of things look like, as, as well as non-invasive ventilation when appropriate but also some symptom management. But I'd say probably on the inpatient side, it's a lot more of the goals of care and talking about um, transitions, um, maybe some anticipatory guidance as patients are learning to deal with their new diagnosis. Um, in the intensive care unit specifically, there there have been documented a few different models. Um, one model coming out of the, the, the West Coast is more of an integrated model where the the intensivist actually has palliative care training and provides that that palliative care service in addition to what they're doing from the intensive care uh, standpoint. Um, more often, I think we're seeing the consultative uh, model where the palliative care team works alongside and in collaboration with the ICU team. Um, sometimes there may be more of a mixed model where there's an intensivist that feels very comfortable with primary palliative care. Um, but when things get more complex, um, they're happy to call in the palliative care services to help out. Um, so again, um, with this fourth trajectory, um, just remember there's a lot of prognostic uncertainty. Um, and unfortunately, we have to live in some of that uncertainty. And, and it makes it very difficult for having conversations because things may not be straightforward. It's It's hard to always say that yes, this patient is going to do poorly, or yes, this patient is going to die, or this patient is not going to survive. Um, within the neurologic um, realm, there are patients in persistent vegetative states who have gotten the trach and peg um, and have done, have been in that state for years and will suddenly wake up. Um, those are rare instances, and I don't necessarily think that we need to discuss those cases specifically with our patients. Um, but that's always kind of lingering in the back of the mind. We don't want to necessarily give a false hope to our patients because we know what the trends typically are. So in cases like this, I'm often talking to patients about what it looks like to get to that stable point. Is a trach or peg something that you would want to be doing? Um, is it something where your loved one would want to be in um, in the ICU, going to a specialty hospital, going to a nursing home or rehab for, for several months before we even see what this new, this new stable point is. So kind of talking about what the, the road looks like to get to that point um, can be very helpful for patients and families as they're trying to make these decisions. I did want to highlight that there's a, a strong overlap um, within neurology, palliative care, and even rehab. Um, so we do know we've, we have some re, uh, rehab doctors in the area who have gone through the program as well. Um, this diagram actually dates back to 2007. So we're talking about 15 years, but I, I think it's just as relevant today where when we look at the, the shades of blue is really where palliative care becomes, should be most involved. And that's really in that acute care setting at diagnosis and then at the terminal care setting um, near death. Um, Within that realm, acutely, we're talking about kind of where we're at and, and what needs to happen and providing a lot of anticipatory guidance. As patients stabilize, they may end up seeing more of the rehab doctor for a while and even um, seeing a rehab doctor with, with um, palliative care education as well. But as things slowly progress, as that debility um, causes its own comorbidities, palliative care may play more of a role. Um, and then there's a shorter track as well where uh, conditions may be a little bit more progressive and you may see 
more of a role for neuro and palliative care collaborating without necessarily involving rehab. But these tend to be the tra trajectories that we, we see our patients um, going through. Um, again, back in the ICU, there's a, a, a few different contexts in which we, we are, are talking with the patients. Things that we specifically acknowledge in, include the loss of personhood. So a patient may have been functional in, and independent, but now has a stroke, um, and life is going to be completely different. Cognition and personality can often be affected by traumatic brain injuries. Um, even glioblastomas can, can change who that person is compared to who they were. Um, so working through some of that is important, um, but also talking about who should those surrogate decision makers be. Um, and then there's a lot of shared decision making as, as we try to, to grapple with a new diagnosis and, and how decisions should be made. Um, to some extent, brain death is something that, that we, will, we will talk about. Usually that's in conjunction with the ICU or the neurointensivist or the neurology team. Um, but the palliative care team should be there supporting patients when that that becomes a reality that we're going to go through those protocols. Um, a couple of years ago, um, we did a study here, and one of our neuro residents actually looked into the data. Um, we, it was retrospective. We looked at two years worth of data in the ICU before we had a neurointensivist and neuropalliative care, and then two years um, after both were hired on, um, just kind of um, uh, coincidentally, um, we had myself and um, a neurointensivist hired within a month. So we actually found a point in time that really looked, could be used as an intervention. So we wanted to look before that and after that. Um, we specifically looked at the number of palliative care consults, hospital length of stay, um, ICU length of stay, and mortality. Um, within that, um, numbers were fairly similar, 130 versus 144 um, admissions to the ICU. Um, there was really a, a trend, but no significant um, difference or increase in palliative care consults when that neurointensivist came on board or when we, we formed that partnership. But what we did found, find was that there was a lower median length of stay, um, 11 days versus eight days. Um, but also the ICU stay was shorter. Um, so from a, a hospital administrative side, people look at that and say, oh, that's great. Um, but I look at that and say, hey, that's one last day we're in the ICU and we, we can be looking at getting you home or where, where you want to be, whether that's home or rehab or wherever. Uh, so patients can move on out of the hospital to, to living their life um, a lot sooner. But what I really want to highlight is that mortality rate did not change. So what's happening, um, that how we can best interpret this is that we're having those um, those talks a lot earlier. We're starting those conversations about goals of care. And by getting that earlier involvement, we're able to get patients on the road, whether that's trach and peg, whether that's home with hospice, whatever their, their case may be, um, we're able to get their, them there sooner because we're having those conversations in, in, in partnerships with the ICU. So let's look closer at the outpatient setting. Um, again, um, I get to use the term history. Um, early on, uh, around 2014, 2015, um, a lot of clinics are, a lot of the palliative care clinics were starting within the movement disorders um, clinics, where they would have a movement specialist as well as a palliative care doctor. Um, some included wound care, others had spiritual care, and other sort of nurse um, care coordinators. Um, with some variable um, services, depending on the other the clinics you were in, such as a nurse, social worker, PTOT, psychology. Um, and a lot of those early findings did find that patients with Parkinson's disease um, had a, a similar symptom burden to those with advanced cancer, uh, metastatic cancer. So a lot of times our patients aren't necessarily asking us or telling us about symptoms they're having, but by going through an assessment scale like this, this is the Edmonton symptom assessment scale, you can really get at the core of what patients are, are suffering with. Um, there is actually an ESAS PD for Parkinson's disease. Uh, so uh, the questions and symptoms are a little bit more targeted towards those patients. Um, I'm using 
using both of these in the clinic just to get an idea of where we are, where patients are when they're coming in to see me. Uh, some of the bigger things that we are dealing with are probably that fatigue and constipation, um, cognitive changes as well. Again, a lot of the patients go or symptoms go unrecognized because patients aren't um, volunteering that information. So the more you can do to ask those questions, uh, the better off your patients are going to be. Um, again, constipation, dysphagia, anxiety, pain, uh, drowsiness, fatigue, insomnia um, are, are all, all major things. Um, there's been some look into um, sexuality as well. And there's there are a lot of um, symptoms related to that, um, that Parkinson's will bring on that patients are not, not excited to share, but can be very important in, in probing there can be helpful in improving their quality of life too. Um, looking at how palliative care and neurologists work together, um, what we've, we've learned along the way is that referrals based on needs tend to work better than referrals based on prognosis. A lot of patients are going to live for years, maybe even decades, and there's a lot of need up front. And, and personally, that's why I got involved in this myself, is I recognized the need for um, services that were not being offered, that were only offered if patients were hospice eligible, which is um, very advanced stages um, within months of, 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 of dying. Um, but patients um, have these symptoms and have questions and have emotional distress and caregivers are 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 stressed um, and by having that support up front dealing with these specific needs can be very helpful um, it's recommended that consults are defined um, what are those specific things you want the palliative care uh, providers to be doing are there specific needs or symptoms um, a lot of times it's more of a co-management approach where their neuromuscular specialist or their movement specialist will continue with their care and their assessments, um, but the palliative specialist is there to look at that 10,000 foot view. Um, sometimes it really is that patients are at that advanced stage and that Cinemet isn't working or it's time for those ALS patients to come off some of the uh, disease modifying medications. And it's a transition from that neuro specialist to the neuro palliative care uh, provider. Um, and we'll see that maybe for months, even before patients either are emotionally or, or physically ready for, for hospice. Um, primary goals, again, in the outpatient setting, um, always symptom management, focusing on how can, how can we live as well as we can, maximize life, um, but also anticipatory guidance. Uh, a lot of times, Patients are worried about what lies ahead, and it's they're they're having trouble getting the information that they want. Um, and then advanced care planning is also um, part of that as well as we move down that road. Um, so who benefits from palliative? Um, again, I'd say we'll we'll talk first about patients with chronic progressive illness, um, uh, and then touch on patients with static illness as well, but. Um, when we see things like Parkinson's, the ALS, muscular dystrophies, dementias, epilepsy, uh, I'm seeing some genetic disorder um, patients with genetic disorders that have graduated out of pediatric oncology. Um, we're seeing some neuroinflammatory like MS, leukodystrophies. So each one of these um, illnesses really does take a different approach. Um, but uh, the the clinic we have is really set up for all comers because these diseases do come with, with so many of their own sort of nuanced sort of needs. Um, but there's also the patients, again, with the chronic and stable conditions. So patients with stroke or TBI, um, central pain from a thalamic stroke, for example, um, I'll, I'll see a lot of patients in those settings. Um, but also more and more, I'm, I'm doing neuro-oncology. And once that tumor is resected and patients have been through chemo and radiation, um, they are left e essentially with, with um, neurologic deficits, and it can almost be seen as a traumatic brain injury as well. And there's a lot of um, adjusting to what that new normal is. So we're having a lot of those conversations um, with those neuro-oncologic patients as well. Um, there are, along with those um, patients, um, there's some 
approach our, our there are some things that go along with other malignancies uh fatigue um neuropathy some of those things that we're dealing with as well but um, other things they may experience are seizures headaches um cognitive changes i've seen a lot of patients where they've had a a, a frontal tumor that's resected and their personality has changed they've lost some of their executive function and we're trying to coordinate care for for them provide support but also get them into appropriate clinics as well like um, a tbi clinic or get them to rehab as well so there's some partner and partnership and collaboration that happens on that end as well um, so where does palliative care happen um, most often i'd say in the outpatient setting it's in those ambulatory clinics um, we have an embedded model um, such as in our als clinic where uh, patients will see um, me as that neuropalliative care provider, along with the neuromuscular provider. But then um, I also work function somewhat in that consultative model in which um, I'll see patients separately from their movement disorders doctor, where um, they may see their their movement doctor on um, on maybe a biannual sort of or sometimes even annual sort of setting. But we're touching base every three months. Um, constantly changing and tweaking and, and talking about symptoms and making sure the medications are still working for them and, and um, that they're well supported as things progress. Um, more on an international scale, you're seeing more of that home-based palliative care. Um, I'd say that's more of a norm in Europe. Um, and a lot of our neuropalliative um, providers in, in Europe are actually geriatricians. And and so they're able to do a lot more of these home visits. Um, I say, I would say it occurs to some extent um, here in West Michigan and nationally, but not to that same extent that it's being done internationally. Uh, there is a role for telemedicine. I'd say that uh, with the right patient where you've already developed that rapport and you're able to address more symptoms, um, that may be a good way. Um, we have a lot of patients in rural areas or where it takes hours to drive in. Um, some people may prefer to have those conversations um, in that telemedicine setting. So, I mean, it's not my favorite. I'd prefer to do more of the in-person, especially when we're talking anticipatory guidance and goals of care, but this is a tool that we can use when patients um, may not be able to get into the clinic. And mobility does become an issue. Um, patients with uh, power wheelchairs may not have that transportation they need to get into the clinic or even getting out of bed and getting ready for the day, getting out the door could be a two or three hour process. So consider this, this might be a quality of life measure for patients as well, because they don't have to get up and, and go see the provider. I wanted to give this example of multidisciplinary clinics. Um, First of all, ALS clinics are nationwide and have been around a lot longer than neuropalliative care. Um, whether they know it or not, they've been practicing in a primary palliative care sort of setting. Um, but now um, neuropalliative care has kind of caught on to that and you'll actually see some multidisciplinary clinics like I mentioned within, within Parkinson's. Um, we're talking about the potential for a, uh, what, what does that look like with our neuro-oncologic patients as well? So. We're moving into those realms, but I just kind of give um, a list of these staff and services here so you guys have an idea of who typically is involved with these multidisciplinary clinics. Um, I, I say physicians here, but um, we're, we have more and more PAs um, and nurse practitioners who are um, just as involved um, in providing these services as well. So. Um, from that realm, we may have um, neuromuscular specialists, neuropalliative care. Some clinics actually have pulmonologists um, right embedded in the clinic as well. Um, respiratory therapy um, becomes a big thing to help with monitoring pulmonary function tests. Um, dietitians become important as we're dealing with dysphagia and peg tubes and nutritional supplements going through the peg tubes. Speech plays a big role in that as well, as far as those swallow evaluations and helping with communication. Uh, physical therapy, um, occupational therapy, help with adaptive devices and mobility. Um, social work is always there. 
And then uh, we have our dedicated um, RNs who are very helpful in coordinating all of this care between the different specialties, talking with the insurance companies, and making sure that things that we say are going to happen do actually happen. So it, it takes that team effort to, to make this really work. Uh, so I do want to talk somewhat about treatment strategies, um, symptom management um, in the time that we do have. Um, a lot of times um, things can be very diagnosis specific, but in general, these are areas in which we are addressing um, patient needs. So within the realm of movement, there may be limb weakness, loss of fine motor movements, loss of gross motor movements, need for things like power wheelchairs or other devices, um, lifts, Hoyer lifts, um, transfer devices, um, and other things within the house. Um, speech, again, we're dealing a lot with dysphonia and dysarthrias, um, and, and we're working closely with, with our speech therapist team um, who can help with with other devices through the alternative and augmentative communication clinic where they can actually sit down, meet with the patients and talk about which devices may help them continue to communicate as best they can with their family and loved ones. Um, within cognition, um, memory is a big thing. It's not just episodic memory, but we can see loss of executive function, apraxias in which you forget how to do those day-to-day -day sort of things like what to do with a toothbrush or or how to drive. Um, um, working memory as well, being able to hold bits and pieces of information to, to balance all that inf incoming information, work through it and come up with a logical conclusion. Um, loss of iatrogenic, or not iatrogenic, um, but IADLs, um, things like balancing the checkbook, cooking, um, impulse control with, with some of the frontal lobe injuries, um, insight. Patients may not understand that what they're doing is unsafe to do anymore. Um, swallow, um, movement disorders, neuromuscular disorders, dementias often develop into um, dysphagia with uh, concern for aspiration and weight loss. And that role of artificial nutrition may be different between that Parkinson's patient versus that stroke patient or that ALS patient. Um, breathing is another big one. Um, Dyspnea uh, can lead to daytime fatigue, um, somnolence if they're not sleeping well at night. Uh, so we do spend time looking at pulmonary function tests, specifically that forced vital capacity, and then the uh, inspiratory and expiratory pressures. Those really help us determine what are those muscles of respiration doing and how, how well are they helping. Um, and then we'll talk about um, invasive and non-invasive ventilation. Um, there will be a... a lecture on that sometime later this year as well. So we'll dive into that deeper. Uh, but then seizures um, prevent or present their own sort of problems with loss of independence. Patients are, suddenly aren't able to drive. Um, cognitions, cognition with seizures over the course of years and years and decades can and have its take its toll on the brain and impact cognition. Um, anxiety over when that next seizure is going to happen can can also play a role. So we look at all those sort of things um, with these patients. Uh, so I did want to touch on enteral feeding. Um, I do have a question here, and maybe I can open this up to the fellows if you guys are willing to give it a guess. When you're looking at Parkinson's disease and dementia, is our our peg tubes life prolonging? No. I don't know. I would say I would guess no. So we have we have a vote no in the. So we have a no. Are there least, anybody who would dementia. say? Anybody for, would say yes? I would I would say that there are uh, certain um, uh, neuromuscular disease that probably does uh, stroke depending upon the uh, level of debility that they have, other than directly related to the stroke. And probably the same for Parkinson's, I would say. But, but dementia, I think the data is pretty clear that it doesn't. Yeah. So for Parkinson and dementia, oftentimes we're saying, no, it's not life prolonging. Um, usually by the time that a patient needs, um, needs a feeding tube in advanced Parkinson's, we're looking at very end stages where there's gastroparesis, um, things are slowing down. So with loss of gut motility, um, even if we're putting food in, 
it's not going anywhere. Um, so the calories and nutrition, A, are not doing anything, uh, but B, may be causing more distension, nausea, and vomiting. Um, and again, as you guys are all aware, um, peg tubes don't prevent aspiration. So there's enough secretions and other things going on that can trickle down into the airway. So doing it for an aspiration reduction um, is, is not really an indication. Um, and then as John alluded to with stroke, um, neuromuscular disease, yeah, there, there may be a role for this. Um, particularly um, with stroke, we may see a peg tube as bridge therapy. It might be that thing that, that helps patients get that nutrition in um, while they go to rehab, um, spend some time waiting for that stroke recovery. And there's a fair number of patients with stroke who may be able to come off of it. I'd say we have to consider it in each patient specifically, there may be some with more devastating strokes where it's not going to happen, but um, if, if their overall function other, other than the swallow is looking pretty good and there's signs of potential um, recovery, it, it may be a good option to discuss in that, that context. Um, ALS, neuromuscular disease, again, patients can live for years and years and get all their nutrition through that, through that feeding tube. So that may be something that we say, you know, in that context, in that setting, it, it's providing that uh, provide, providing that survival benefit, and patients may say, "Yeah, that that really meets my goals." Um, and again, a lot of that gut motility isn't as affected, so we're putting food in, and it's actually able to to go in and do the things that it needs to do to provide that that health. Um, when we are talking about peg tubes, oftentimes people are um, using nutritional supplements, but often the conversation can be that it's just a means to the stomach. So if anything that can be liquefied can go in, uh, by all means, um, you can go ahead and do that. You're not, A, not limited to um, just the nutritional supplements, but um, B, just because you have a peg doesn't mean you can't eat either. So we're, we're often recognizing or um, talking to our patients about that ability to still eat as they're able to do. And some people will eat for some pleasure, but then get most of their calorie through the peg tube more for, for a conven convenient sort of standpoint. Um, sometimes um, within ALS though, it's good to recognize that it's it's not intended to that reverse that cachexia. ALS is catabolic and patients will continue to lose weight no matter what. Um, so keep that in mind that the goal is not to gain weight, not, um, not necessarily to reverse that cachexia. Um, again, um, we, we can try to stabilize some of that weight BMI in some conditions. Um, there's no, again, that aspiration risk we talked about, but I wanted to highlight here quality of life. There's mixed evidence as to whether or not it improves quality of life. There's that convenience factor for patients, um, for both meals and a lot of patients like the idea of medication. And if you tell a patient that they can burp through their peg tube, they find that very helpful because it helps with gas and bloating and distension. So patients may say that quality of life is significantly improved, but then you look, you ask the caregivers and they're going to tell you that there's a negative impact on, on their life as, as they're having to try to set up the feedings, take care of, maintain, flush, keep the tube clean. So there's really kind of a mixed sort of balance there that needs to be considered. Um, looking at secretions, um, sialuria is a big one. Typically, we're starting with um, tricyclic antidepressants. Um, we can go to glycopyrrolate. Um, that one tends to work well. I like that one a lot because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So if you're already dealing with cognitive issues, um, this one's not going to add to it. Um, you're not going to have those anticholinergic effects. Atropine eye drops, uh, we're all using um, very regularly. Um, they, they're good uh, short acting when we need that, the secretions managed um, right up front. And then Botox, we're actually using a brand called Myoblock because it is a little more anticholinergic, um, but Botox itself could be used as well um, to, to kind of paralyze or weaken the, 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 the secretions from the parotid and submandibular glands. And then with thickened secretions, we're using more mucolytics like guaifenesin, 3% nebulized saline, Acetylcysteine can be used, not maybe not as tolerated as, as well, but we're using suction cough assist, and we can actually use percussion vests as well to help break up the secretions 
when a cough assist isn't working. Um, but also increasing fluids can be helpful. Keep patients hydrated and they can do well. Uh, so in, in for those who are interested, these are the targeted areas where we go for um, those Botox injections. So we, we hit the parotid gland right about here, and then submandibular gland is about midway between the angle of the mandible and the chin. And, and a lot of that can just be done right by palpation. Some people will use ultrasound, but that's not necessary. Um, we'll talk more about breathing with neuromuscular disease, but I just wanted to highlight these things. It's really more the mechanics of breathing than, than anything else. Once you get that air in, gas exchange happens at the lung tissue. Uh, so a lot of what we're focusing on is devices to help move that air in and out of the lungs. So that's why we look closely at the MIP, the MEP, and FVC. Um, symptoms that may you may want to uh, keep an eye out for that may suggest some breathing issues are, well, dyspnea and fatigue. Morning headaches are another one. Um, opiates can play a role when it comes to dyspnea, um, but a lot of these patients will do well with non-invasive ventilation. Um, it will, and one thing to consider is um, there are some patients who are concerned that opiates will be too sedating or cause confusion and would rather do something like a non-invasive ventilator um, in order to preserve more of that cognition uh, for longer periods of time for better interaction with their, their pa family and loved ones. Um, pain, I wanted to specifically talk about non-neuropathic pain here, a lot of somatic pain. Um, we can see muscle cramping with increased tone and spasticity. Joint pain may develop either frozen shoulders or with it within ALS, we're seeing that with the muscle at atrophy, joints aren't seating like they used to be. So um, we can usually get away with NSAIDs for a lot of things. Um, morphine and opiates are very appropriate as well, um, but muscle relaxants may be something else that, that you could consider um, in these patients. Um, I say that with, with um, the, within the context of Sometimes spasticity is a good thing. If if we give too much of a muscle relaxant to somebody with Parkinson's disease, they might might not be able to maintain that tone and posture in order to walk and ambulate. So too much of a good thing, we might get their pain under control, but now they're non-ambulatory. So keep that in mind as you're using those muscle relaxants. And again, uh, there's supportive equipment, uh, power wheelchairs, hospital beds, mattress overlays can be very helpful. Um, for those that day-to-day -day sort of picture. Uh, pseudobulbar affect, um, we see that as inappropriate laughing or crying. Um, think of somebody reading a Hallmark card and then crying for the next five minutes uncontrollably. So something may trigger it, but then it's an um, exaggerated um, emotional response. And patients will even say, I don't feel as sad as I'm looking. Um, so it's just more of a motor response. Um, and if for those who are interested, it really comes down to neurodegeneration of the corticopontocerebellar pathways. So there's this three-way pathway where the, the cortex, pons, and cerebellum are all talking together. That gets disrupted, and, and we get this motor response. Uh, historically, the treatment has been with SSRIs, SNRIs. As of the early 20-teens, um, New Dexta, which is the dextromethorphan, quinidine has been the go-to. The dextromethorphan is an MDA receptor um, antagonist. So it always, whenever I come across this, I ask myself, would something like Nemenda work or maybe even ketamine? I don't know. I, I, I haven't had time to look into that into the literature, but that would be something to consider doing as well, particularly as new dexta tends to be pretty expensive. But we can actually compound dextromethorphan quinidine for purposes of dysphagia. Um, more so um, because it doesn't, it's not commercially available um, in a liquid form. So if patients need to have it delivered that way, they, they can get it that way. Um, but um, otherwise, um, we need to use the, the, the commercial, uh, commercial um, pill that is available. Um, quinidine, again, just real quickly, is that uh, cytochrome P inhibitor, which just allows that dextromethorphan to last longer in the sy system. Um, impaired cognition, 50% um, of patients um, in ALS may have um, loss of executive function. Um, FTD is a big thing with it within ALS, 5 to 
percent may have FTD. Some studies go as high as 30 percent. Uh, that's usually the behavioral variant uh, where you see more of that disinhibition, lack of empathy, apathy, uh, loss of executive function. And in, in some cases, we can actually see that it, it occurs well before the ALS manifests. Um, but you could also see an FTD present as more of a primary progressive aphasia where patients just suddenly lose their ability to speak, um, either expressive or, or um, receptive. Um, it can be non-fluent or agrammatic as well. Um, this does add to a higher caregiver burden. So um, got to keep that in mind. Um, advanced care planning. Um, oftentimes we're talking about those future treatment options. What does a PEG look like for you? Would it work for your dysphagia? What does a non-invasive ventilator look like? What would a tracheostomy do for you? And what are living arrangements? Is home still a safe place to be? If not, how can we make it safer? Do we need to be talking about moving to a, a, a care facility? Um, and then early on, we're establishing what is that code status and that durable power of attorney, again, in anticipation that at some point, um, patients may lose their cognitive functioning. Um, Early on, patients may want to just talk more about prognosis, education. There's typically a lot of questions about what does this mean for me? Um, patients do want to plan for death as that natural outcome. Um, we as physicians and, and providers should see this a death as, again, a natural outcome, but not that, not that failure of our treatment, um, but it is to be expected. Uh, prognostication, again, can be very difficult, uh, but there are patterns and trends we can talk about and we can focus on what life may look like in order to help patients better understand, kind of make some of those decisions. Um, again, a consensus consensus review from several years ago really says let's let's talk about these early, just because of that anticipated loss of communication or cognition. Um, and recently, a patient's spouse told me this: um, being able to talk about the most difficult decisions and have those conversations before it's urgent or immediate or as an immediate need has been hugely important to me. It's it's made it so the hard is not just hanging over our heads, but but out in the open and we can move on to focus more on positive things. So these are things patients want to talk about. It's the elephant in the room and they need somebody to help them explore these topics and then move on to, to other things, kind of put that aside and say, yeah, we got a plan for that, but let's focus now on, on where we are in the present. Um, I did want to talk about um, patient preferences in advanced care planning. Um, I looked specifically at patients with ALS. Um, we did a survey a couple years ago. Um, and what it, uh, I wanted to show kind of how, how comfortable patients are looking at different things. Um, so talking about different treatment choices, CPR, ventilator, um, feeding tubes, what you'll see is a lot of these patients are comfortable or very comfortable addressing these topics. Um, uh, a well, well over that 50% majority um, are, are willing to talk about it. And when it comes to talking about it with others, you'll see again, we're, we're talking almost in the 80, 80 percentage. Patients might not be as comfortable sharing with friends, but with their primary care doctor, their neurologist, I, I extrapolate that to, the, to their palliative provider as well. They want to be having these discussions. So um, let's make sure that they can have, have those discussions. Uh, what I found interesting, too, is when you ask them how well informed patients feel in making these choices, um, how well they feel, and then whether or not they've come to a decision on some of these things, the more informed they are, the more they're able to come to a decision. So you'll see with CPR, naming a decision maker and having that living will or that advanced directive completed, um, th there is actually a statistically significant um, difference. So Again, the more we're talking about this, the more they can have those those um, those decisions made um, in advance. So ventilation and tube feeding, you can see a trend towards significance, um, but there wasn't quite enough um, there in the numbers to say it was significant. But again, suggest that the more we're talking about it and informing patients of what these what these are and what they can do for you, the the um, better prepared they'll be. Um, so when should we be talking about end of life with these patients? Um, big thing to highlight here is that first episode of aspiration pneumonia. So usually that happens so far upstream, but usually something like that is that triggering event for cyclic rehospitalizations and 
loss of uh, functional decline over time. Um, but all of these are, excuse me, are, are good things to, to keep in mind. So infection, dysphagia, decline in functional status, uh, cognition, weight loss, um, and all of that. So with the time we have left, I wanted to touch on caregivers because they are just as important in this whole, whole process. Um, this study a couple of years ago looked, um, gave caregivers the caregiver burden inventory. 35 was the cutoff. And you can see that caregivers for patients with ALS and acute brain injury um, really are above that cutoff. Um, they, they've got a lot going on trying to care for their loved ones that they're at high risk of burnout. Um, Parkinson's is very close. Alzheimer's disease and MS are, are to a less of an extent, but it is something that um, we're uh, we, we do need to, to keep an eye out for. I put this in here just as a reminder, the ALS functional rating scale is a zero to 48 scale, 48 being the best, zero being um, es essentially dead um, or being the worst, um, looking at 12 different categories. But where that becomes important is when we look at caregivers, when somebody is at 30 or, or greater on the FRS scale, um, they still need about five hours of, of daily care. Um, once we get to more advanced stages, that FRS of less than 10, we're looking at 15 hours of care in a day. Um, the number of caregivers may go from one in the beginning to up to three. Um, and it takes a team to, to help these patients. And half the caregivers are still trying to work full or part-time. Oftentimes that's how they main, maintain insurance for their loved ones to get the healthcare they need. So. Tasks can be any anything um, kind of medically or think uh, about those um, ADLs, but also patients need supervision, uh, transportation, and housekeeping becomes something that um, needs to be considered. When we look at stress levels between patients with ALS and um, their caregivers, um, Patients actually here again, the lower stress reported stress in the last two weeks in percentage of respondents, you see those patients are actually at kind of that, that curve is a little earlier. They're less stressed out than their caregivers are. Um, so they're uh, for whatever reason um, doing, doing kind of well, but the caregivers are trying to balance care for their loved ones while maintaining a household. Um, there's uh, a devastating financial impact that this can have. Um, caregivers give up on their own health. They can't make it to their own doctor's appointments. Um, so um, their, their health and function is worse. Um, and they may, um, as we'll see in the next side, slide, they may um, negatively view their, their loved one, um, kind of feel like their loved one or their disease has really kind of Change it, it changed the entire dynamic between the patient and, and the caregivers. When dementia is in, involved, there's um, caregivers are three times more likely um, to, to report that, that higher caregiver burden. Um, pay, uh, caregivers often will feel too like they're unable to live their own, uh, own lives and that can lead to some of that negativity I was talking about. But when we look at support, there's not much out there as far as what we should do with this. But in that general sort of setting, we need to be talking about planning. How can we best plan for what's coming down the road? But then how can we solve particular problems? What's the most bothersome thing? And are there things we can do to kind of get around that? And then identify what's modifiable. What can we change? But then also recognize what's non-modifiable and naming what we can't change and not offering that false hope for some of these unchangeable things. And that can better help reconcile feelings of frustration going on in those cases. Um, off, also, real briefly, burden of interventions. Um, we need to look at well, that PEG, for example, we talked about quality of life may be better for the patient than for the caregiver. Uh, but we should also, in, in that sort of context, we need to be asking ourselves, is an intervention we're doing reasonable or appropriate to continue? Is the care received disproportionate to the benefit? Um, we really need to consider the caregiver in a lot of these interventions. Um, does it provide that benefit to justify the time by the caregiver? Um, in the end, it really comes down to that autonomy of the patient for what they want should be balanced against those societal requirements. We need, we need to take in that ethical consideration of justice as well um, and try to find that balance so that both the patient and caregiver 
can be living as well as they can, uh, despite the disease that affects both of them. Uh, so in summary, um, we looked at the inpatient versus outpatient approach. Um, there's different approaches based on the presentation of the illness. Um, trajectory can play a role, and that caregiver burden also is, is very important to consider. So with that, I will open it up to questions in the few minutes that we have left. Well done, Joel. Uh, this is uh, always, uh, I think, important and valuable, and we learn a lot from it. Um, I know I do. I mean, I learned something new on the, on the tube feedings. I, I didn't realize that that was a, um, that the evidence had not supported it in uh, Parkinson's. So that was uh, mm -hmm. good for me to hear that. Uh, questions from, from the group, comments? Uh, I have a little comment, if you can hear me. Yeah. It seems like that the relief for the caregiver when you get a peg tube is on a kind of a curve. Um, if you get the peg tube before feeding has become a, a very large burden where they're spending an hour and a half with a syringe trying to get the person to swallow and watching them choke, when it gets to that point, it relieves the caregiver quite a lot because then they can just kind of um, give up doing that chore uh, three meals a day. But then of course, when the patient declines and declines and is no longer with it and is no longer able to do anything for themselves, um, the fact that they're on a feeding tube kind of maintains their, um, life function maybe longer than the caregiver, um, would appreciate. So I feel like there's a curve of, uh, or a, a moment where the um, feeding tube really does relieve the caregiver of some, of some difficulty, but then um, maybe later on or too early, it wouldn't. Right, right. Kind of gets worse along the way. So um, we, we as providers should remember to have that conversation. Is that, is that feeding tube still something that's helpful and reassess where we're at with those things too. So thanks for pointing that out, Alice. Uh, Joel, there's a, a note in the chat about caregiver support groups. You talked about the importance of uh, uh, of supporting the caregiver as our you know, as as a team and practitioner. But uh, do you have much interaction with the uh, support groups uh, for uh, for caregivers, or are familiar with? Those? Yeah, so so we have uh, several local support groups for patients. Um, there's probably close to half a dozen grassroots support groups for Parkinson's disease. Uh, some of those will be for patients and caregivers together, but a lot of them recognize that need for caregivers to, to kind of meet alone. Um, a couple of years ago, there was actually a group that met at um, Grand Traverse Pie Company, and the, the spouses with Parkinson's would all get together and just eat pie and have fun while the spouses, uh, as the caregivers, could talk and kind of, in, 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 in essence, commiserate, but kind of come up with game plans together and talk through problems they're all having. So that was one of my favorite support groups. But um, for ALS, I know the Susan Mast Foundation locally has support groups, both for caregivers and for, for patients as well. So they, they do exist locally. <laughs> 